The main reason the F-35 came along is that Congress embargoed the sale of the F-22's technology outside the United States. Yep. And so they couldn't legally sell the F-22 to more than about two or three countries in the world. So the idea was, well, we'll buy an F-35, it'll, it'll be cheaper, everybody will be able to buy it. The flyaway cost on the F-35 is going to be higher than the flyaway cost on the F-22. And the only reason they've been able to meet the milestones is they keep moving the goalposts closer because, oh, well, we can't quite get there, so we'll, we'll ease the requirement. It's going to be the biggest disaster in aviation since the F-111. I mean, you know, and they, you know, it's going to be a disaster for exactly the same reason. They decided they could build one airplane that would be the super duper aircraft for all the services, and you can't do it. You can't yeah. get there from here. So now we need to talk about the people's Republicans. Yes. I, I just want to say that for seven years I loaded bombs on F-111 Fs and Ds, and to be honest, they're a big to work on, but they're really nice planes. Yeah, but they're once they got to the D's and the F's. They're also not being carrier aircraft or operated by no, the no, Marine Corps, which was the idea. I, I understood the initial what what you meant by that because the B model was just for the Navy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so welcome to this panel about People's Republic of Haven. We have, I think, sixty-six percent of attendance of the panel, so which is okay. <laughs> <laughs> We have David Weber here, who is the author of Honor Harrington, for those of you who don't, don't know it. <laughs> uh, and we also have a training as a historian to come in handy. My name is Jan Kotoc. I come from Czech Republic, which when we were Czechoslovakia for a certain time, we were called Czechoslovakian People's Republic, People's Republic of Czechoslovakia. So I have a sort of, or my, me and my family have a sort of internal experience with things we are going to talk about. Let me so, throw one other thing in. He is a, an Honor Harrington fan. He is also a published science fiction author in Czech. So he has some additional insight coming from there before we start talking about this. Thank you. And basically, Haven is there are people that are faster than comparing it, for example, to USSR and or the Soviet satellites like Czechoslovakia was, or the revolutionary France, which David helped in a little bit by naming the main end. One of the main end is Robert Stanton here, or Rob S. Pierre. A lot of people didn't get that until they got to the last page, but they were, you know, I was surprised. <laughs> and anybody, you also like to compare it to the and as a segue to the Navy problems we were talking about before, to USA without civilian oversight, getting, giving a, getting a free ride for like 30 years? Well, it's um, essentially, in, in, in a lot of ways, I think this becomes more evident after the restoration of the Republic, when you start seeing what the original Constitution mm -hmm. looked like. Um, the People's Republic is the United States of America after 200 years of deficit spending and a deal by the political elites to perpetuate the system in return for perpetuating their hereditary hold on power. I wouldn't like to say anything about 97% incumbency re-election rates or anything like that in the United States. I wouldn't want anyone to think I was making any immediate comparison. <laughs> um, but, but that's really where it was. And one of the reasons they gave me Rob S. Pierre was that was the big red herring that I was waving to keep you all looking for Napoleon when what I actually had in mind was Cincinnatus restoring the Republic uh, and that Theismann was the guy you should have had your eye on all the time to pay no attention to that man behind the screen kind of thing. And it worked surprisingly well. A lot of people were like, wait, he killed Napoleon when Esther got killed. And we're not expecting Tom to come out of nowhere and, and restore the Republic. Well, basically, the Haven, as you describe it, it started as, as I think the most important planet outside of Solarian League at that time, when it was like at its at its best. And the problem, I think David described in the first anthology, which is more than honor, the afterwards, is that basically Haven the problem and 
for Hayden started when they had simple problem bits, sorry. For me? You have a question? No. Okay. Um, yes, there is. When, if, uh, eco if our economy, like a healthy capitalistic economy runs so for a long time, there was a pro started to become a big gap between the very rich and very poor. Is that how you describe it originally? Um, and they started to do some surprise, socialist surprise. program. Yeah. Well, the thing, that, the thing that you have to bear in mind is that in any society, the members of that society don't compare themselves to someone else and say, boy, I'm so much better off than a farmer in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. They compare themselves to the, own members, the members of their own society and say, boy, he is so much better off than I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's legitimate. That is who you should be comparing yourself to, is the members of the society in which you live. Um, and what happened in, uh, in Haven was that they had an economy which was sufficient to generate a surplus, and they decided that the surplus should be redistributed. And it was, you know, the classic slippery slope. Uh, and one of the things, and I'm speaking here as a historian more than as a, uh, than as a political, this is, this is a historical observation. Um, the ability of a society to expand and to provide for its citizens depends upon the surplus value that it can generate. That surplus may not be distributed equally or even equitably but it has to be there for the society to continue to increase its capacity. And you reach a point where you have a moral requirement to not allow members of your society to live in poverty or want in an affluent society and the need to deal with that on the one hand, and how far can you go before the surplus that is driving the entire society forward on the other hand is re-diverted and no longer available to do the job it was doing of pulling the society forward. And that, in essence, Mandicore solved that equation in one way, and Hayden <coughs> solved it in another. Um, and Mandicore did have the advantage, which Haven lacked, of the Mandicore and Wormhole Junction. Uh, sort of like Norway has the advantage of all of the, um, the North Sea oil that goes directly into the Norwegian economy every year. Well, basically what you said, I, to me that Europe now has lots of problems with basically, not all do, not lists exactly, but there are lots of people in many European countries and it's not, some, not, somewhere it's more, somewhere it's better, where there, there are groups of people who are just basically on and going to the unemployment bureau, getting their cards that they are unemployed there, then that for state support until they find a new job. And the more children they have, the more support they get. So in many European countries, I don't know about the US, but in many European countries now it's actually uh, uh, prosperous for some people to do nothing and have 10 kids. Because the more kids you have, you, of course they don't, they don't like live in Hilton, but they don't want to live in like. When, when, I, was, when I was in England for Easter a few years ago, one of the fans who came up to me said, uh, I am the first person in my family in five generations, five generations, to actually have a job. Okay? Uh, and I said, you're, you're kidding me. And he said, no. He said, it goes all the way back to 1923 uh, when his, his great, great, whatever it is, grandfather uh, was working in the mines, the coal mines. Uh, when the British economy, the British economy tanked before anybody else's in the 1930s, um, and um, his, his went on went on the dole, and he said, and it has taken until me to get off. He said there are pockets of that kind of poverty in England, although the, the UK is generally affluent. There are pockets, and he said, you know, when you are looking at the one hand on here is an income that I know I can count on. And on the other hand, I have to get out there and take this scary step of, of finding employment and, and risking that secure niche. He said, it's hard to, to convince yourself to do it. Um, 
and um, he's uh, he's very successful. And now he did say that the education that he got, he was able to get because of the support for education. It was also part of the system that was available to you if you went out and looked for it. And so he's not telling me this is horrible, terrible, you know awful bad idea. He was telling me this was one consequence of it. That and, and he said, you know, and he said it's not a small family that he's talking about. Um, and, um, and 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 that can happen. Okay. Um, uh, those are EU dollars that are being spent on his education, not British families. <laughs> well, it's just uh, okay. Let me let me put it this way. Well, look, we've got the same situation going on here. Yeah. Exactly the same situation. I mean, if you want a quick and dirty, easy look, pick some of the areas in West Virginia. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's well, exactly the same okay. situation. Well, okay, let, 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 let me throw this out. Okay. I, I think it's probably clear from the way that I write <laughs> that my views would be considered somewhat right or center uh, in the United States. And in Europe would probably be, you know, why don't you have the armband with the swastika on it? You drop a nasty right wing for them. However, let me be perfectly plain about it. Human beings, okay, there are certain things about a human being which are going to be true whether they are incredibly wealthy or they are poor, okay? And one of the things that is going to be true is going to be that you are. When Ben Belva was asked at one point how he got authors to meet their deadlines and to overcome writer's block, he said, you take away their credit card. <laughs> okay? And human beings are motivated when it is necessary for them to do something. <clears throat> they can clearly see why that has to be done. Okay? Now, if your function is to provide roof, food, clothing for you, your family, you will do that in whatever way works best. Okay? And if you are willing to settle for what I need are the basic necessities, and someone is willing to give you the basic necessities, and something inside you is not pushing you to say, I can do better, I want more, okay? then you will settle for the basic necessities. And when that happens, you have someone who locks an entire generation into that mindset because, as we say down here, the acorn don't fall far from the tree. Um, the, what you, what, the way that you live your life is the model that your children are going to use as their base starting point for their lives. Okay, yeah. That's actually true in Czech Republic. Also, families now are still struggling with the way their parents view the world and their grandparents view the world. And but, I, okay, child abuse is a generational phenomenon. <coughs> okay, uh, uh, domestic violence is a generational phenomenon. Okay, um, if you look at um, attitudes towards education, those are generational phenomena. All right. There are positive and there are negative generational phenomena. But we disregard the fact that they exist at our peril. All right. Um, and I think that's something that liberals and conservatives, if they are able to hold a conversation without throwing polarizing phrases out there, <laughs> will find themselves in agreement on. I am a, I'm more of an Edmund Burke conservative than a, you know, we have to go back to this, we have to go back, we have to go back to the other. Burke would have told you that social change is inevitable, that social change is good, that social change that improves everybody in the society is good. What he would have been screaming the whole way, though, is look before you leap. Okay, he would have been incremental. Don't clear cut an institution to replace it with something else. Improve the institution that you have. And so in my books, the societies which succeed are primarily those which work on an incremental improvement basis 
rather than on the we're going to blow up the existing institutions and start over again. Because nobody ever will repeal the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> and the biggest mistake that you can make is to say, I understand all the factors driving the society and therefore I can design a system which will, will cater to them, will meet them, will satisfy them. Um, the institutions that most societies have have evolved over centuries. If you go back and look, they've evolved over millennia. And they're not perfect. And they have inequities, and the inequities have to be addressed. But when you start throwing out the baby with the bathwater, one of the things that you do, and I think a lot of people don't think about this, one of the things you do is you deprive your new system of legitimacy because it derives its legitimacy from the historical legacy that underlies it. And if you kick that, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the system in uh, the People's Republic of China today, okay, a lot, a lot of that Confucian system is still there undergirding the party. And if the party loses the legitimacy that comes with it and is seen as a as simply a, a money machine for members of the party, which is a risk they're beginning to run. Then they lose their legitimacy, and China may see its system collapse as well into something else. And to, to actually return <laughs> to the top, uh, that's part of what happened to the Republic of Maine. Actually, it occurred to me what you said before about, about how we are formed with what our parents went through and how, well, so the society we grew up in, and you know, lots of people, especially I think in America, but not only, they're confused. For example, white people are still supporting communists in Eastern, former Eastern Bloc countries. You know, in, in Czech Republic, basically every election, communists get 50 percent, give or take, 15. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't want to scare you. All right, no wonder you're here. Are you going home? <laughs> okay. I'm tired. 15, sorry. <laughs> not, that, not as bad as it was before. Okay, yeah, but their time difference was seven hours, yeah. guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the the fact 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 fact. You. Okay. Uh, but if to give an example for people like my grandmother, and she's been work and she makes no secret that she's still voting like communist, and we long ago gave up gave up on any attempts to sway them. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, from her life view, she was born in 1930. She was born during the, when the depression was starting. She grew up like, basically loving everything. Her mother was sorry, lived in a village. She was working for some rich guys just doing knitting or something like that. Not very much money. And before the depression started to improve, uh, the Germans invaded. <laughs> <laughs> and my that'll put a crimp in here. <laughs> yeah, and my grandmother spent another six years on basically living in a protectorate Bohemia and in Moravia, and and then the so it was she was six, uh, fifteen when the Russians came in, like Russians, I think it was Zhukov's army, and so she so lots of people saw the Russians as liberators, which. You know, the common food soldiers, were, it was not their fault, they were under Stalin, the common food. And so they, she saw them as liberators. And basically what uh, communism at that time provided, and I don't mean to say that it's great in any way, it's not, but uh, it was a good, it was like sort of crisis management. It was an improvement. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had a, um, a teacher, one of our teachers at the university, well, a history teacher, he had a class called Global Appeal of Communism. And it was always like an uproar with lots of the students. How can you say that communism has an appeal? <laughs> but he said, okay. Historically, it did. Historically, it did. And he said, after the Second World War, uh, there was, everything was lacking in a freshly liberated Europe. And what Soviet Union had were the basic necessities they could provide, like heat, food. By 1945, they had that. They improved from the war because they pushed the Germans out and they had all that. And the, usually the communist countries had problems after like 
20 years when they go away from the basic necessities and people find out that, okay, people in the West also have the basic necessities, but they lost, they've got toasters. <laughs> 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 or ice machines. <laughs> um, and so basically, if you look at most of the countries that ever had communist revolution, you would find out that you would not want to live in the country before the revolution either. Yes. Right. Like being the first of the poor. You wouldn't like to be a serf in Tsarist Russia. Oh, absolutely. You wouldn't like to be a poor guy in a village in Vietnam. You wouldn't like to be... Of course, Cor Cor Korea was war torn. Well, time. the... Perhaps the equivalent here in the United States. Um, I turned 61 last month. Um, I was born in. Thank you. I was born in 1952. Okay. My parents lived through the Depression. Okay. And World War II. And the model that we grew up with was somebody who had lived through the Depression and World War II. Okay. So when the 1972 recession came along, we were like, okay, we understand what's, what's going on. Okay. Well, then came 2008. All right. It had been 30 years since there had been a serious economic downturn. I can't begin to tell you how many people in their 30s and even some in their early 40s who I ran into who are like, this is the end of the world. Nothing like this ever happened. <laughs> the worst economic downturn depression since the Great Depression. Folks, if you look at the Great Depression and you look at the United States in 2008, you're going, say what? <laughs> okay, but they're already talking about the end of the world. But it's like I was saying, you know, people in the society don't compare themselves to the farmer in Zimbabwe. They compare themselves to the farmer here. And a lot of what happened in 2008, a lot of the panic, a lot of, you know, we gotta fix this, we gotta do that, we gotta do the other, was the result, frankly, of the expectations of the people who had never experienced that sort of economic downturn and who were historically illiterate. Yes. Okay? And that is a huge part of the problem in any society with a representative form of government at any given moment, is that people are ignorant of their own history, and therefore they fall prey to the soundbite. And that has become increasingly prevalent as electronic communications have replaced print communications but it was always there, okay? People, it's uh, Steve White, uh, who I mean, I've read a couple of books, uh, <laughs> likes to quote, uh, he, li he likes to quote, uh, not sure, it might be uh, Timmy Brunson, anyway, uh, he said, he has uh, Ivan Antonov say this a couple of times. Uh, people who fail to study history are fortunate if they're allowed to repeat the mistakes of the past rather than making worse ones. Uh, John C. Campbell's version of that is history repeats herself and repeats herself until finally she lashes out with a spiked club and says, now will you learn? Okay. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. And that's one reason why uh, people in Haven probably didn't learn from history. No, but people in, we always think we can do it better. I have actually had a conversation with a PhD in this country. I will not tell you who he is. I will tell you that he teaches history and economics in a major university whose view of communism is simply, well, they didn't do it right. We can do it better. <laughs> My history professor, Drew Brennan, oh, my. Uh, sorry. The global appeal of communism, the class, he also said that he had a professor like that. Yeah. He was like, he also always saying like, yeah, communist, socialism was great in this and great in this, and the students raised their hands and said, but how about the millions of peop the people in Ukraine and Siberia? And he said, oh, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's exaggerated. But the other, the, other thing, the other thing that you have to bear in mind is that most of the isms that are floating around today are intellectual constructs, okay? 
they were put together by people who decided to create, if not a utopian society, something along those lines, rather than settling for, well, what do the people of the society want it to be like? You mean the All right. Beg your pardon? The real world. The real world, yes. And oh, the, th the thing that you have to bear in mind is people think of history where we are at any given moment. They think of, okay, this is the way that it is. They think of it as this is the snapshot that frames the way that it is. What they need to be thinking is this is one frame in a movie that has been going on forever and what we think right this instant is permanent and immovable is changing the whole time we're standing here because it consists of human beings, okay? So humanity is a work in progress. As a good Methodist, I have no problem with that concept. That's how we understand it. But it is also true in a historical sense, okay? We, the most, stat, even Egypt, ancient Egypt was an evolving society, okay? At the pace of glacier, perhaps, <laughs> but it was evolving. And the evolution, evolutionary process speeds up every time technology changes because we have better tools and we have higher expectations because of our increased physical capabilities. And that is why we are looking at a situation which by, in a historical perspective is changing at breakneck speed over the last couple of centuries, okay? And a lot of the people who are screaming, you know, we gotta throw off the brakes, need to be aware that to throw on the brakes in social change requires you to throw on the brakes in the change of every other aspect of your society. And the people who are saying, well, technology is evil, we need to get rid of it, we need to settle for a lower plateau, are overlooking the fact that it is the technological capabilities of society that drive the upward evolution of overall standards of living and our moral concepts of one another. Same as people who say that we should be all isolate ourselves and be isolationists, they don't realize that w whenever it happened in history that two basically cultures were next to each other, one influenced the other. Even if one was dominant and the other was subjugated, they still influenced each other both ways. Yeah, the Mongols conquered China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how did that work out for the Mongols in the end? Um, the <laughs> I think some, did someone have the question? Yeah. I remember already. Right? Something I read in the New Yorker 20 years ago, a uh, Russian political theorist said that socialism was invented by Western European intellectuals as a uh, response to democracy, that is American democracy, because socialism required a bureaucracy to run it, which the Western intellectuals would fill, as opposed to democracy, which didn't need a bureaucracy. At least, uh, well, it shows you how far we shifted from that uh, sense of the 19th century. So there, there is some truth to that. Say just that uh, before the like, Russian Revolution in 1917, nobody, the, the socialist theory assumed that socialism is the next step in evolution and it's like after capitalism. Yeah. Meaning that without capitalism you cannot have socialism. It's a natural evolution. Which made Russia a very strange place. <laughs> for Everyone was surprised. Yeah, so the only place where Russian revolution was not supposed to happen was Russia. Yeah, well, it, 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 Marx expected it. Lenin was surprised that it happened. Marx expected it in, in Western Europe and thought the United States might be the only society that could evade it uh, because of the degree to which uh, the American bourgeois were owners of the system to begin with. Um, and, and, you know, it's, there are some very useful concepts in Marx's analysis of history, but the problem is Marx was a 19th century liberal imposing a view of upward progress on history. And people who use Marx to analyze a society or a culture or an economy today need to be, Darwin, not Darwin, um, Malthus, Dr. Malthus, was absolutely right about the fact that the entire human race was going to starve, except 
that he didn't know the Green Revolution was coming. <laughs> All right? And that kind of changed the parameters a little bit. And everybody knows that this planet will be unfit for human life because human civilization consumes so much energy and it's going to increase on a geometric basis. So we're all going to be dead within 150 years, except fusion power is coming. Okay? So... Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> you reach on fusion. Well, okay. The, fusion 20 years, 20 years ago. Now it's fusion 20 years. Yeah, well, but okay, my, my, my primary point is that, is that historically technology has been an enabler. That's what it does. And as you reach a different level, okay, before the industrialization, before the Industrial Revolution, you could make a pragmatic argument that a large uh, labor force was necessary to work the land at very low wages. And therefore, you could make a pragmatic case for slavery to work the to work the farms, even while you were saying, you know, we hold these truths to be equal, to be to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Even when you are embracing the Judeo-Christian belief that every living human being is individually important to God, you're like, okay, that's all true. But in order for people to survive, somebody has to work. Okay, well, all of a sudden, along comes mechanized farming. And you can no longer make that pragmatic argument. So you are now forced to grapple with the implications of what you said you believe and deal with them. Are you going to turn your back on them or are you going to figure out how to live up to them because technology has now raised you to a point where you can. The same thing is true about women's rights. Oh, heck, uh, uh, post-civil vice about women's lifespans given how many of them died of childhood yeah. fever and whatnot before he came along and said, you know, if you wash your hands and use a brass bedstead, more of these women will live. Okay? When, as we move increasingly into a society which you, where you can't make the argument, well, it's muscle dominated, you have to be brawny to do the jobs, all of a sudden we're faced with the argument, well, well why can't women do the same jobs that men do in an industrial information-based society? And so, again, these issues come to the forefront. It's worth noting, Africans did not free themselves of slavery in the United States. I'm not trying to downplay the, the, the passive resistance uh, by the slave population, nor am I trying to downplay units like the Massachusetts 54th or the other black units that served in the army. But the truth is that they did not free themselves, and women did not vote themselves the vote. They had to, that those changes depended on convincing a majority of the population that was already privileged to extend those privileges on the basis that these people are human beings too, they are my equal, they should have them, and there is no longer a reason I can use to deny them to them on the basis of strength, of the, we need to have the labor force, of whatever. We have another question. Oh, okay. Phoenix, you answered some earlier progress. Well, what I was just saying, you know, point that also reflection was you know, that you know, socialism was kind of also like reaction to understand capitalism with child labor and all that. So you kind know, of have to bring that in. Oh, absolutely. And socialism, okay, it's also important to distinguish between the the Western concept of socialism and the concept of communism, which are not really the same animal. I have a lot more problems with communism than I have with socialism. I have problems with socialism, which are based more on my reading of history by far than on the moral imperatives that drive it. Okay? Um, and I think we may, you know, I was talking about technology being an enabler. Okay, we may reach a point at which socialism, Western variety version, genuinely becomes workable because of increases in technology which are going to make the energy and the manufacturing capability and whatnot available to make it work. But I will be absolutely astounded if a human society ever evolves that isn't stratified in terms of privilege and power. 
bei Sozialen Sozialen und der Welt von Ludwig von Mises. Der Welt von Ludwig von Mises, das Sozialist Calculation Programm. Um, I very probably, probably have, but since I have never heard the name properly pronounced, don't recognize it. <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was the question, or we, what did he ask? Hmm? What did he ask? Marcus, can you, can you project back that Yeah, one? we couldn't hear you. No, so, uh, sorry, if you ever heard of Luki Van who was a professor of economics from Vienna, and he has a problem, wrote a book called Socialism, Social and he came to the conclusion that socialism is impossible because you cannot calculate. If you do not have private property, you don't have prizes. And then, this was an example. Good to me, how would you, good to me, how would you compare, for example, the original People's Republic of Haven, the legislatures, and then the... And Ron Peter. Ron Pierre. <laughs> make meaning like, we would have to do a historical analogy. <coughs> well, you can take it as a very, 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 very slow version of the Bolsheviks joining the government and boring from within. Um, except there is an element involved which is being hinted at in the books. It hasn't been brought front and center yet. And that is the degree to which the, the Mason alignment had its finger in the pie up to its elbow. Um, this is not turned up in any of the books yet, but the Duquesne of the Duquesne plan was a Mason Alpha line. Right. Oh, and they were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dad, you just answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, a lot, a lot of the legislators were were Mason lines that were buried there for the express purpose of crippling. The people's well, then they, they, they yeah, a couple of them. And when Robespierre came along, an awful lot of Mason lines got snipped <laughs> in the curve. I mean, they did, they were like, okay, well, we're fine with the, you know, they're even going to be in worse shape, etc. But remember, I think it has been made expressly clear in the books. They never saw Manticore coming. Okay, Manticore was so far below their radar horizon that it was they didn't even worry about it. Um, and they did see, the, the danger was that the, the Republic of Haven was the largest extrasolarian polity in the galaxy. And it was firmly behind Beowulf's view of not just genetic slavery, that's the issue that you see on the surface that they're worried about, but also the Beowulf uh, bioethics uh, uh, position. And they viewed they said, hey, we take care of our friends by killing them all in their sleep in, in the Solarian League. But what happens if this power out here stays unified and lines up with Beowulf and really makes a problem for us because we don't want to take over the Solarian League. We want to split and divide the Solarian League so that we can build our power base in the rubble. Okay? And they were afraid of the threat that Haven represented. So they heavily infiltrated Haven and pushed. It's been said several times in the books that the, the original People's Republic is the result of a corrupt deal between governing political elites and the recipients of the welfare system, and in particular the Dulles managers, who were the, the level that they, they basically the Dulles managers are bureaucrats. And in administering the largesse of the government, they buy and control those. That's why they're called dolist managers. The other reason is because they managed the outflow of capital and of services to the dolists. All right? Well, you get a bunch of alpha line guys here who are pushing their already corrupt, deeply entrenched, uh, incumbent advantage uh, fellow legislators from above and the dullest managers who are pushing from below, and you get this, 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 this bargain written in the back corner of hell to permanently enshrine the legislaturalists as an hereditary governing class in return for making sure that the taps stay open so that the dullest managers retain <coughs> their privileged position um, in, in, in the society as a whole. Okay, well it could all have happened completely spontaneously, all right? 
there's a very good chance that it could have. But the Mason alignment wasn't willing to wait for it could. And so they embarked on a generational policy to cripple the Republic of Haven. And turning conquistador was just fine with them because the more corrupt Haven became as a conquering power, the less likely it was to back Beowulf and be a force for mom and apple pie. And after right. months, Haven would have no other territories to conquer. They would still implode on itself. Well, that would be that would be fine. But they, they, basically, they're looking at a way in which they have turned the basic Havenite economy into a black hole. Okay, that they're going to be unable ultimately to sustain. And ultimately, what they wanted the People's Republic of Haven to do is exactly what they're aiming for the Salarian League which is to fall apart into impoverished successor states that are on each other's throats, all right? Unfortunately, Rob Pierre came along and killed off most of their alpha lines that were steering the process in Haven, and Manticore came along and refused to lie down and die when it was supposed to, and all of a sudden they've got this incredible upsurge in war fighting technology, and oops, okay? Like I said, nobody ever repeal the law of unintended consequences, except where science fiction writers are concerned. Robert <laughs> <laughs> Pierre had a good way that he had the, uh, basically he could activate, uh, make the Dolis do something after several hundred years, yep. to, because he promising them something better, and basically his supporters became part of the government. The, the, the process is actually a little more compressed in time than a lot of people realize. Um, it was 17 something when the process started. I think. So the passing the, the law against engineers on the grade? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, see, the process actually started well before that. Right, right. Uh, but that's kind of like a punctuation point. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Um, just, it's slightly off topic, but. Um, oh, that never happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I, I wondered is. Um, so the original intent of the Mason alignment was to break up the Solarian League. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, they didn't see Manticore coming, but Manticore was used as the catalyst for that in many respects. Is it in the Mason, so the Masons attacked Manticore. Yeah. They had intended to attack the Republic, but weren't able to pull it off in quite. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the, the question was, they, they also, uh, they wanted the Solarian League to be pulled apart. They unintentionally managed to, through their actions, get Manticore and Republicate to ally. Would that be seen by them as uh, positive, or to, would it be seen by the Masons as a positive or negative thing? It would be seen as a major oopsie. <laughs> uh, the problem is that you now have the only two, well, okay, the only two navies in the galaxy with fully developed uh, multi-drive missile capability and so forth are now buds. Okay, and probably the only people who agree more with the Bay of Wolfens than the original Republic of Haven did are the Mandys, who are one warp junction transit away from them and who are intermarried with them and send their kids to Bay of Wolf schools and everything else. And also, okay, in their, in their defense, Okay, the base of alignment didn't see the Manticore and Wormhole Junction coming either. Remember, they've been working on this for about 600 years, and the Wormhole Junction is only 300 years old, roughly, by the honors time. Only. Oh, That's like Steve Martin driving the British woman he wants to impress through LA and says, this is the old part of town. Some of these houses are 40 years old. <laughs> um, but the... the um, from, 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 the, from the Mason Alignment's viewpoint, this was a very bad thing. Okay, now, courtesy of Eric kind of pulling the plot line forward, it's an even worse bad thing for them than it was supposed to be. No, Eric excuses me. No, <laughs> this wasn't supposed to happen until the tech had equalized more between the Alliance and everybody else. So right now, the Alliance is kind of in the position of clubbing baby seals, you know, whenever it goes to you know, has to, to engage somebody, so. Yeah. But did it not accelerate the Solarian? Uh, the Solarian breakup? Mm, yes and no. Basically, the Solarian breakup was always predicated, okay, 
the Solari breakup wasn't supposed to happen yet, okay? But the Mason alignment is like, okay, they're kind of having to adapt as they go on, which they've done for 600 years, so fairly successfully. But their problem here is they were supposed to engineer a war with the Solarians, okay? And the Solarians were supposed to get really hurt really bad going up against the Mantis. But then they realized, you know what, the Mantis might win, <laughs> all right? So at that point, this is an even worse outcome from their perspective. So they go with the, all right, we have to cripple the Mantis and hope that the Republic of Haven will take them, will take them out because the Republic of Haven is still this kind of more ramshackle institution, you know, the whole nine yards. They, Manticore became the primary threat when the Manticoran Alliance emerged, when the size of the Manticoran Merchant Marine became evident, when the combat power of the Manticoran Navy became evident. So what they decided to do was they were going to kill the new threat using the old threat by, by clearing the path. Now ideally, if you'll remember, they weren't supposed to launch the attack until they were able to do Haven and Manticore combined. And the idea is, all right, we have a war between the Solarian League and these guys. The Solarian League is getting whacked. The Solarian League comes apart. Now we launch our Pearl Harbor strike to, 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 to emasculate the guys who are winning the war, and the whole situation comes unglued. Plus, if Rob Pierre hadn't come along, they'd have had a cadre planted in the Republic of Haven ready to, oh my god, we just got hit by this massive sneak attack, to steer them in another direction. Okay, and we have a Two questions, small one. We don't know where Bullhole is, the Mantis don't know where Bullhole is. Does Mesa know where Bullhole is? No, they don't have a clue where Bullhole okay, so, is. So it wasn't just they didn't have enough sneak bombers, they also didn't have the location. Yeah, it's like, you know, you can't do anything about it. And, and because they didn't have enough force to take both of them out, they concentrated on completely crippling the Manticore Alliance in hopes that since we're at war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Haven would hammer them. And then maybe we can figure out where Bullhole is later. And then the dynamic duo showed up. Right, right. And then the dynamic duo showed up. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Second question is more like to the actual topic of what the... Oh, how did that happen? The tech was what we're talking about. Was, you said well, when Pierre came along, wiped out the legislature, smashed the glass ceiling, set the mob loose for another apathy. Was it was that also do, eventually doomed to failure, or if or would Pierre have actually accomplished his goals? Pierre, he Pierre actually, in many ways, did accomplish his basic goal. Pierre, okay, you got to understand. Part of Pierre's goal was to kill the legislaturalists for killing his son. Okay, that was the way that he saw it. He didn't count on the war. Well, no, he he counted on he counted on the fact that we were at war with Manticore, and that was what made it possible for us to do it. Okay. What Pierre saw was first the man was a genuine reformer when he started out. He was genuinely <coughs> upset over the the fact that even with the Dola system, the Dolists are sinking more and more into the pathological aspects of a of a closed urban society. Okay. Um, he recognized that the system could not continue as it was running at this point because it was going to fall apart, you're going to run out of people to conquer, you can't keep doing this. He recognized a corrupt political elite, hereditary, hereditary elite that was closing people like him out of the system and perpetuating the system and apparently consisted entirely of lemmings. Okay? And so his intention was to shatter the existing political and economic matrix. He wanted to break the system that was running the Republic and running it into ruin. And he also wanted to break the, the to use 21st century buzzword, the entitlement culture that was stagnating and choking the economy at home. And he succeeded in both of those. Okay? But you remember, all 
the way through, you're seeing scenes where like he's standing there in his office and he's looking out over Nouvelle Paris and realizing, you know, that he's become worse than the legislaturalists were in terms of how many people he's killed, how many people he's disappeared, etc. Because he's on the back of the tiger. All right. In your view, even if he hadn't been killed in the Queen's coup. The, the system still would have just eventually toppled over the same. He might, he might have pulled it off, but it is, it's unlikely because of it had. Okay, remember that Esther the Queen launched her coup before she was ready because she misunderstood and overheard conversation. <laughs> These little things happen, especially when it's the Napoleon analog and I got to get rid of her. <laughs> Pierre was actually a saner person than his, than, than his successor. Saint-Just was, Saint-Just actually had admirable qualities, but he was in effect a sociopath who had given his allegiance to Pierre. And when Pierre went down, all that Saint-Just could do was to try to continue what Pierre had tried to, been trying to do and becoming even more repressive in the process. Without understanding the ultimate goal. Well, I think he actually understood Pierre's what Pierre's ultimate, ultimate goal was. was part but of I don't idea. think he was capable of achieving it. Right? All right? There was the uh, analogy of how long that Stalin's closest lieutenants lived after he died, yeah. like very uh, or Czech pres Czechoslovakian President Clement Gottwald, for that matter, because Clement Stalin died in 1953. Clement Gottwald went to his funeral, returned from his funeral, and died. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody knows how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle. Well, I just okay. The thing is, the thing is that trying to drive a society in a chosen direction is really, really, really hard, okay? The most successful political leaders in history have been those who already knew where the society was headed and who may have influenced that direction considerably, but they do it by guiding the flow rather than getting behind driving. Okay, Pierre was in the position of getting behind and driving. Pritchard is in the position of recognizing where the society is going, wanting to go there herself and steering. And the person, the critical person in, in the <coughs> Republic of Haiti is Thomas Spizer. Is he a secret or is, was his mother possibly uh, no. an alpha? Or? Well, it, it, he had, no. There are quite a few capable people who are not. <laughs> I didn't mean that he was a mason, but his mother uh, was a orphan, and uh, I'm just wondering if some of his capabilities sound like he might be genetically in his No, not really. Feisman, Feisman is that thankfully not unknown in actual human history uh, kind of guy. He is a man of higher than average capability and massively higher than average integrity, okay? And that integrity has pushed his ability into going places it might not have gone on its own. For my money, in some respects, he's actually accomplished substantially more than Honor Herring. Yeah. Hand back here. Yeah. Uh, paths for the various societies. Are you strictly going by what's already happened in history or what you're seeing currently in politics? Actually, what happened is I wind them up and then I wait to see where they go. <laughs> no, I mean, think about this. Think about this. I'm telling you the story. I have kind of a general idea of the evolution that I right. need, you know, when I start. But as I'm writing, as characters grow, as political events flow into one another, as battles happen, as technology changes, okay, the societies involved change also. 
Yes. That's one of the things that makes the outer version work. Okay, everything in the outer version is interrelated because that's my view of how history and human societies work. That's why the technology changes. I, I had Steve Jackson come up to me and say, I love the, the, the Honor Harrington books and the Starfire books because the technology changes. Okay? Well, the same thing is true of the societies themselves. If you go back and you look at the legislature's People's Republic of Haven, and you look at Eloise Pritchard's Republic 20, 25 years later, okay, look at the mammoth changes. And then you go back and you look at the Star Kingdom, which has become a star empire, and which now has to deal with what happens when we bring all these people who don't share our political traditions and whatnot into our government. What happens to the system that has worked so well? Okay? And that is a critical part of telling the story for me. But I don't know where they're going in any kind of detail until we get there. I know a book or two ahead, okay? Now, I know, like, okay, I buried the Mason alignment, and the Mason alignment's going to do all this crap over here, and I know it's going to have implications. But when I set the Mason alignment in motion way back when, okay, I knew what their agents were trying to accomplish, and what they had accomplished in the, in the Republic of Haven, but I didn't know the shape. The, you know, I knew, like, maybe, if you want to put it this way, I knew the skeleton, but I didn't know any of the musculature at that point. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, this is for one hour or 90 minutes? Uh, for an hour. Okay, okay. So, so we have like three minutes. Okay. Uh, Dave, in some ways, Feisman is the equivalent of George Washington? I think of it more as Cincinnati's, but yeah. Well, capability wise. Yeah. George Washington wasn't the super general, but his integrity was so much he refused to become king, which well, he might have tried and which would have maybe been disastrous. <coughs> what, I would, what I would say about Feisman, first of all, I would say that Washington is substantially underrated as a general. He preserved the army. He yeah. preserved the army and he understood the strategic parameters of his problem exactly. Right. Okay, in that respect, he was superb. And on the few occasions where he actually got to exercise command in the field with a trained, disciplined army and subordinates who knew what they were doing, he did pretty well. <laughs> okay. um, so I would, I would, I would say that Washington was better as, as a general to give him credit for. Um, it, there's not an exact analog for Theismann or most of the characters in my books. Um, I would say that Theismann achievement, though, is more akin to kind of a combination of Washington and Cincinnati, perhaps, in that, you know, Cincinnati, you know, familiar with Cincinnati, the Roman, okay, who went back to his farm, rather than, yeah, went back to his yeah. plow. Um, the thing is that Theismann Theismann acted on what had always been Theismann's primary loyalty, which was to the idea of the Republic of Haven. He never turned against the Republic of Haven at any time. He was, remember the, the conversation that Parnell has uh, with uh, Castle? He says, he says, you can't go back. Okay, she needs people who will fight for her, but you can't because she'll kill you the instant she gets your hands on you talking about the Republic. Right. Okay. That was Theismann. Okay, Theismann was the guy who could continue to work for the Republic because she had to figure out he was trying to make her go back. Okay. And once he got there, he could have succumbed. He was in a perfect position to succumb to warlordism and say, okay, this system is so broken, it needs an iron hand to get us through the, you know. And he was perfectly willing to be the iron hand fighting the war, okay? But he knew, not simply that he didn't like politics, but he knew that he had to restore civilian government if he was going to preserve the gains that he made. And so he turned to a person who had connections that were both to state security and to the Aprilists and so forth. But the main reason he turned to Eloise Pritchard was he knew her by that time. Okay. 
okay? And she understood that he was trusting her to continue that part of the job where he literally, as a man in uniform, could not do the job. What he had to avoid at all costs is what we've seen over and over, most recently in Egypt. Okay, we've had one election, we don't need to have another one. We have a president and he'll be with us for a long, 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 long because the time. Time. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and, and Theismann, Theismann was a good enough student of history. One of the things that he and Honor have in common is that they are both intense students of history. And it informs their tactics, it informs their strategies, and it also informs their views of their society. <coughs> absolutely new that he had to get civilian government back up and running while it could be sheltered by someone like him who would refuse to set it aside on the basis that it's not working efficiently, we're having problems, I have to go in and take over, et cetera. Um, and it was that confluence of those individuals that made the, 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 the restoration of the Republic possible just as it was Theismann's position as the commander of Capital Fleet that made the overthrow of Saint-Just possible. And it didn't hurt anything that he had Esther McQueen's little black book. Uh, you know, so. and, and McQueen is frequently, McQueen was not in it just for personal power. I mean, she was, not, she was perfectly willing to be president for life after, <laughs> after she fixed the problems, which is how she differed from Theismann. But her objectives and what she was trying to stop, what she was trying to fix, were much the same aside from the political reforms that she wanted to make, the social reforms, the economic reforms, the end to the death, to the, the disappearance of political opponents, all that. She wanted to stop that. It occurred to me before we go to the last question there that if McQueen succeeded, do you think Heisman would have supported her the same way as he supported Dolores Richard? I think if the Queen had succeeded, Theismann probably would have said, this is the system we now have, and done everything he could to mitigate the negatives and accentuate the positives. Uh, partly because his chance to succeed in a coup against the Queen would have been much lower. Um, Saint-Just understood repression, all right? The Queen understood how to attach people to her. Well, she understood the leadership, <coughs> which it, to some extent Pierre had. The problem is that Pierre, by the time of his assassination, had been forced to so many uh, iron repressive movements that the image of him as a charismatic leader had been fatally undermined. Okay, Saint-Just never had that going for him at all. He had always been the policeman, the executioner, the enforcer, the leg breaker kind of thing. The Queen would have had the enthusiastic support of a large chunk of the Navy. Um, she was popular with everybody except the mom in Nouveau Paris. Um, and she would have had a clear-cut policy of what she was going to do and almost certainly would not have had the the widespread fighting that Theismann actually faced because he was not the commander-in-chief, uniform commander-in-chief of the Navy when he launched his attack. He was the commander of Capital Fleet, okay? Um, and also, to be totally and completely honest, because I think more of the, um, the uh, state sec local governors and warlords were willing to take a chance against Theismann initially because he didn't have the towering reputation that the Queen had, even though he was actually probably at least as good uh, a fleet commander as he was. He'd been stuck in Duquesne base all this time. Um, so, yeah, I think probably if the Queen had pulled it off, Theismann would have said, okay, let's see where we go from here. And unless she turns into somebody as bad as as, uh, as uh, Saint-Just or Pierre, I'm going to count this a win. Uh, it would, he would not have been happy in the sense that where he wanted to go was to return to the old republic. 
And some people have overlooked the, ex the degree to which Alfredo Yu is directly responsible for this whole thing because he was Theismann's mentor and the guy who really got him interested in history in the first place. So I mean, you know, I have tucked into these books. This is the character who input because that's the way it works in real life. Okay. So we're very last question. We were talking about secret masons earlier. Are the house schools a mason line, or are they just stupid? House is mainly just stupid. Uh, has been represent okay. Highridge represents, in my view, the worst of the right. Okay? And Houseman, in my view, represents the worst of the left. Okay, the worst of the right is I will do whatever it takes for me to maintain power and prestige and screw the rest of you. And the worst of the left is I know so much better than the rest of you what should be done that my obvious <laughs> enormous ability means I should be the one calling the shots. And by the way, I should be moving into the penthouse apartment as part of the fact that I'm serving my society by, you see what I'm saying? And, and the, the nasty right-wing conservative guy at least is being honest with himself, okay? <laughs> I want power, okay, kind of thing. Um, but they are sort of, I, I trust it, I hope it's evident if you read my books that we're all here. We you read my books. <laughs> that I hold no brief for the extremes of any idea any ideology. That in fact almost all of my villains are extremists. And almost all of my heroes are responsibility takers. That's the key. That is, Dysman is responsible, you know, if they're faced with a problem, they don't say, it's not my fault, or they don't say, well, my intentions were good, or they don't say, I did my best, and wipe their hands and walk away from it. They say, there is a problem here that needs to be solved. I have the capability to solve it. Therefore, whether or not it is legally, philosophically, whatever, my responsibility to fix it, it is my responsibility to fix it. And it goes back to what I was saying about Burke. In order for evil to succeed, all that is necessary is for good men to do nothing. And that is at the heart of the philosophy of almost all my books when you look at the good guys. If you look at Safehold, if you look at Mutineer's Moon, if you look at the Honor Harrington books, that's what's at the core of all of it. Uh, in terms of how I visualize the driving forces. Okay. Anton, you're here to tell us we're yeah, done. We'll have to <laughs> we're through. Think a fork in us, we're done. Okay. <laughs>